All righty. What's going on, everybody? My name is Max Mariotti for Ground Zero Radio, and I'm here with Andrew Baina today. He's a popular metal musician, the guitarist in a band called, called Carcosa, um, and is a popular YouTuber as well. Andrew, uh, welcome. Thanks for having me, Max. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of want to start off by uh, going in a little bit of a chronological order with how did you um, get into metal music specifically? Because um, it's kind of a niche genre um, sometimes for a lot of people. And uh, how did you get started into listening to it? Um, yeah, so I think I started listening to metal music around when I was like 13 years old or so. Before that, I didn't really care about any music at all. Um, but I had a friend in high school who was into new metal like System of a Down, Linkin Park, uh, Mudvayne, you know, um, Slipknot, stuff like that. And I would always go over to his house to hang out and he would always have that music playing in the background. And I hated it at first, but eventually I grew to love it. And uh, he also played guitar. So after I started liking some of the music he was playing, he was showing me how to play it on his guitar. And that's pretty much where it all started. Nice. And speaking of guitars, I just wanted to ask you because um, you're known to have an affinity for like extended range stuff, um, eight strings, seven strings, all that stuff. Um, and just kind of wondering, because a lot of people make the argument for six strings and how, you know, it feels more natural uh, mm. and like, you know, the big guitars just feel a little bit too chunky to feel natural with. But um, I was wondering, like, what your argument would be for people saying that. And, you know, because you like those guitars so much, um, why do you feel drawn to them? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I started playing extended range guitars a really long time ago, like pretty soon into starting guitar. I think I got my first seven string when I was like 16. So only like three or four years after I started guitar. So I've been used to it for a really long time. Um, the main reason that I started was because of uh, deathcore, ironically enough, now that I'm in a deathcore band all these years later. Uh, but I first heard bands like uh, the old Suicide Silence and Whitechapel um, that was around like the cleansing and um, this is exile era. And I had never heard like a low seven string guitar like that before. So I wanted to learn their songs and that's why I bought one. Um, and then it kind of just all spiraled down from there, <laughs> literally. Um, yeah, as for like why I like extended range guitars, I mean, the honest answer is just that you can tune low. And I think that lower tunings for me personally sound a bit heavier. I know not everyone agrees on that and that's fine. There's plenty of, you know, super heavy stuff in like drop C or E standard even as well. Definitely not gonna argue that point, but for me personally and the style that I like to play, I just have always thought it sounded better in a lower tuning. Um, with that being said, there's now like a huge move towards baritone guitars, which are basically longer six strings instead of uh, extended range, meaning seven or eight strings. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I if those were around when I was younger, I probably would have just gone to baritone guitars, I think, instead. But this was like 2009 or something like they <laughs> did not exist or they barely existed at that point in time. Whereas like seven strings were everywhere. So you could just grab that off the wall and be good to go. Yeah. Um, but either way, pretty much my reason for baritone or extended range is just, I like tuning low. I think it sounds cool. <laughs> and that's really like the end of my, my argument, I guess it's, <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah, no, I'm in the same boat with you there. I feel like um, eight strings and stuff definitely sounds, you know, better in uh, like that sounds better for lower tuning than, and all that stuff. Um, and but yeah i mean baritones are really cool and you know and everything but you just can't hit that th those low notes like you can on an eight string i guess and that's my area <laughs> yeah yeah um, i mean I, I guess you kind of can uh, see the thing is like technically a baritone would be fine for me because i don't really use the high strings anyways oh uh, yeah i guess it's more if you want the lower strings and the mm -hmm. higher strings then yeah that's when the eight or seven string guitars come in handy yeah um but again since i learned on seven and eight strings i'm just i'm just used to that anyways and going it feels wrong to go from like an eight string to less strings like you can't yeah. go backwards man like <laughs> after you've gone to that extreme like you, you can't yeah. take it back <laughs> <laughs> um yeah well while we're on the talk of uh topic of gear i just want to talk about um 
another argument that comes to mind, which is like virtual amps versus physical amps and uh, which you, which you prefer and, uh, and why, and just cause that's an interesting one. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I have always preferred digital um, just because it's honestly what I grew up on. Like I never actually owned a tube amp at all until really like this year. Um, so, I mean, it, it started out as a preference just out of necessity because like, again, when I was growing up, there was no way to have like a crazy hundred watt stack of amps and like record it into my computer in a way that was cheap and also not incredibly loud and destroying my house. Um, so out of necessity, it just made way more sense to go digital for me. Um, Cause you know, you could buy like a hundred dollar interface and just plug your, plug your guitar right into the computer. And I was like, well, why would I not just do that? That's way easier and way cheaper. Um, so since that's how I started out, I've just kind of always been on the digital, digital train, if you will. Um, and then, yeah, the digital stuff has only been improving over time, like in the past, like two or three years, especially, um, you know, like with like the neural DSP plugins and stuff like that, like they sound so close to the real deal that like, it's almost just too easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been, now that I have like more knowledge and experience, I also am starting to like tube amps, but I don't think that I would like them unless I had all the knowledge and practice that I had with digital stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's way harder to go straight to tube and trying to dial all that in and yeah. obviously way more costly as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, out of just out of like ease of access, I prefer digital. It's a little more consistent, you know, you can take it anywhere. You can send a DI to someone in a totally other country and they can still just reamp it with the same plugin if you want. Like it's just, it's just easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty much why for recording and stuff. And, um, on that train of thought, if you had a, um, a, a, ba a band member in a different country, um, say internationally, would you, uh, you would definitely work with digital amps to, you know, send those, those guitar tones over to them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Anytime I've done that with, uh, I have a project called one more slice. We haven't done anything in a few years, but it was like a metalcore band. Um, and yeah, like me and Johnny are in it who live here in Canada. And then the other two members live in Virginia. So we would just always send each other files back and forth and it was no problem. We just send DIs and then whoever ends up mixing or mastering it, like they just use their tones. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. And speaking of uh, Johnny and um, metal projects, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your current one, um, Carcosa, and yeah. um, just how that that got started. Because uh, I know it's the same guys from Galactic Pegasus, which was a project that you had a few years back. And what kind of made you want to get back together and start making music again? Um, yeah, so it's the same four guys that were in Galactic Pegasus for the past like three or four years. Um, so we never we didn't necessarily break up like the four of us continued working together the whole time um we actually had all of Carcosa's EP done since I think like August 2019 mm. um so it had been just like sitting in the background for a really long time because we had all basically collectively decided that the four of us still wanted to work together but we didn't want to work under the Galactic Pegasus project anymore um, so we never uh, broke up in the sense of like the members stopped working together. It was all four of us like collectively deciding like we still like working with each other. We still think that what we're doing is good, but this name and this project isn't really the direction we want to go with anymore. Um, so yeah, basically the four of us wrote this EP like last summer and decided then and there that this was going to be the first thing under a new name and a new project. Uh, but it took us until basically like almost a full year after the album was or the EP was recorded to finally announce it. Because uh, obviously starting something from scratch takes a ton of work in the background. Like we had to figure out what our name was, get our logo, artwork, mixing, mastering, music videos, everything. So it took quite a while. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the the short version of the story yeah. behind Carcosa. 
Um, very cool. And if um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe giving us the short uh, the short story behind the name um, of Carcosa, because I know it's a fleeting reference in a story of like a a, a, a city in a short book, a short story, I believe. Yeah. So I still I keep saying this, but I really need to actually read that story because I know that that's where it's from. <laughs> Uh, but the reason that we chose it actually is from a TV show called True Detective. Um, so it's a show with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. It's one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Uh, well, the first season specifically, which is kind of weird. The second <laughs> and third season are completely different actors and different stories. So it's like a, the first season is its own self-contained yeah. thing. And yeah. that season in particular is amazing. Uh, so yeah, myself, Johnny, and Cooper really loved that show and that season. Um, and basically in the context of that show, Carcosa is essentially like a reference for like a secret society uh, that does some very evil things that are pretty disgusting, but the name sounded really metal and like all the imagery associated with it was really cool, uh, such as The King in Yellow. Uh, which if you look at all of our artwork is all like black and yellow. And the reason for that is also from Carcosa or True Detective because the imagery in that show is all like spirals and yellow and black. So that's kind of the reason we ended up choosing that was just because we felt like it had a ton of stuff for us to base our brand identity off of. So yeah, that's that's kind of it. And I know that uh, sorry, True Detective based it off of the short story that you're mentioning, which I do still need to read because <laughs> I feel like a, like a poser or something when I talk <laughs> about it, like you got to know the original or something. Um, but yeah, I think from my understanding, it's basically uh, like a Lovecraftian era horror story, more or less. Um, oh. And I think that the King in Yellow or in the original story is actually uh Cthulhu's brother or something like that but I but like I said if I'm wrong I'm sorry <laughs> and I, I know I need to go read it <laughs> <laughs> um no nah, it's all good um and speaking on kind of that color scheme thing um I personally really love the logo um I'm into graphic design and all that did you guys do that yourselves uh no we hired an artist from Toronto his name is Goth Slam on Instagram he's a tattoo artist uh, he's actually the same guy who made Brand of Sacrifices logo, and that's how we ended up hearing about him and hiring him. Yeah, no, um, it's yeah, it's really cool. It's a cool logo. Thank you. Yeah, we I, I love it too. We wanted something that looked brutal, but was also like pretty readable still. Yeah, like we didn't want something too deathcore in the sense where like you just have no idea what it says. So I think. <laughs> hopefully our ours is like a good middle ground between looking yeah. brutal but also still being able to read it yeah i think i know i definitely asked like my parents and stuff like that i was like can you read what this says uh, yeah <laughs> telling them the name and mo most people could figure it out so nice. we were like okay that's cool good. now yeah the parent <laughs> test that one works um, exactly and kind of speaking on um, branding a little bit, what uh, what was the decision to do a hot sauce for the? Um, <laughs> I, I was kind of curious, but um, it looks really good. But um, I was just kind of wondering why you guys uh, chose that. Um, yeah, so that was an interesting one because uh, we actually know the owner of that company. Shout out to Happy Bat Hot Sauce. Uh, he's a he he's a local guy like we've known him for years um, he was a supporter of galactic pegasus for a really long time and he actually had talked to us about making a galactic pegasus sauce uh, <laughs> back when when you know gp was around obviously and we kind of just never really ended up doing it with that project um, but then when we started the new band he basically just hit us up and was like hey guys like still want to do a hot sauce just so you know <laughs> Um, and, uh, at that point in time, I think we had already done our first merch run and it had actually gone pretty well. I think we actually sold out. So we were obviously really happy about that. And we were like, okay, well, people clearly want merch. So what can we do? That's a little more interesting and different. Um, and of course, hot sauce was, was the answer to that. It kind of just fell into our laps. Uh, again, shout out to happy about hot sauce for making that happen. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And then uh, it was a pretty easy process. We basically just told him we wanted it to be super hot. And we also wanted it to be black if possible, because we have a song called Vanta Black. Um, 
and I don't think I've ever seen a black hot sauce before. So we thought that that was a pretty unique and cool idea and he made it happen. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty hot. It's not, it's not like as hot as I thought it was going to be, but it's, if you don't like hot sauce, it's super fucking hot, but if you like <laughs> hot sauce, uh, it's, it's definitely tolerable. Um, but yeah, it's good. And that, that's pretty much, that's pretty much the story behind the hot sauce. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I might have to pick up a bottle. It, it looks pretty good. And, um, yeah. I have some hot sauce aficionados in my house, so nice. I'm sure they'd be interested to try it. Um, yeah, I think we've got a few bottles left. Sweet. I'll look into it. Um, but kind of speaking on uh, Vanta Black and um, that as a song name, what's your favorite song off of the uh, Absent EP at the moment? Um, uh, it's always such a hard question. I like I don't want to be like, oh, I like all the songs, uh, yeah. even though that is true. Um, yeah. But I think that honestly, my favorite would be A Plague, which is the first song we released. Yeah. Um, for a few reasons. Number one is that's actually the first song we ever wrote for Carcosa uh and also the first song that all four of us ever actually wrote together like even when we were in gp we never wrote songs together it was always like me or cooper or johnny wrote a song it was never all three of us or all four of us rather um so a plague was the first one that all of us collaborative collaboratively worked on um and also of course the first song we released and also the best performing original song that any of us have ever put out onto the internet so just lots of reasons for for that one to be my favorite nice yeah no that's a super fun song um to listen to and to play um mm -hmm. it's really awesome yeah and, it's uh, also easy to play which is good because yeah. it doesn't stress me out <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah but are you guys planning on doing um tours and stuff when uh you know if that all opens back up um we're still not really sure like it, it would really depend it's so hard to say right now because obviously nobody knows what's going on in terms of touring yeah. um but if slash when touring is a possibility like i think we would all like to make it happen we just want to make sure that it's the right offer i don't think any of us are gonna want to go like cross canada for 50 dollars a night or something like that yeah. Um, so obviously it would depend on what the offer is and if it makes sense for us financially. Um, you know, we did, we did the whole cross Canada tour thing when we were younger for like no money and it was a lot of fun. Still one of my favorite memories of all time, but you know, we're all a little older now and you, you can't it's really afford to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, a lot of work too. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, it's yeah. not a not a great career move. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, as long as the uh, you know as long as it's safe and the opportunity makes sense for all four of us, then we would love to. Yeah. And um, what's your favorite venue you've ever played? Like, I know there's a lot, but um, there's there's got to be one that kind of sticks out. Oh uh, man. Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like my favorite venue that I've ever played was probably club mm, yeah club absinthe in um in ontario nice um i think that one was my favorite when we did that cross canada tour back in the day as for local venues um probably the rickshaw is is my favorite nice that's um, very yeah. very cool um touring yeah it's just i mean um, I was reading something about Thy Art is Murder where they, they toured across the United States for, I don't know, like half a year, six months, and they made yeah. like $5,000 each. Like, they, yeah. like not enough to support. <laughs> um, no. So it's definitely kind of a hit or miss in terms of um, that, you know, it being lucrative. But um, yeah, well, and even, even money aside, uh, you know, obviously if you want to be a full-time touring band, that's like yeah. a huge life and time commitment. Like, I don't know. I don't think I personally would want to be on the road six to eight months of a yeah. year. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a fiance and yeah. stuff like that. And yeah. obviously my YouTube channel, I can't just not make videos for half a year yeah. um, or just not see my, my future wife for half a year. That's not really something I'm personally interested, in, but yeah you know, doing like one or two, like really awesome tours a year or something like that. Like that sounds like pretty, pretty good to me. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but kind of, um, on the subject of YouTube, um, what made you choose that as a kind of a, almost a primary platform to work with because it is kind of, um, 
you know, like I said before, it's kind of hit or miss in terms of um, as long as you work really hard, I guess um, anyone can do it. But what kind of what was appealing about that to you? Um, well, I didn't start out YouTube with the intention of it being anything. I just started it out with it because I thought it was fun. I liked making videos. I liked making covers. And this was also, you know, back in 2009 or 10 or something. So I don't think Ad Revenue even existed at that point in time. Um, so yeah, I was just doing it for fun. And then eventually it came to a point where I had a couple of videos that blew up, uh, which I was not expecting, but they did. And then that's when I kind of learned like, oh, you can actually make money off of this. <laughs> uh, and then that's kind of when I started shifting my focus to being like, okay, well, is this actually a viable career path? And at that point in time, it was not <laughs> because I wasn't <laughs> getting enough views to, you know, it was like a hundred bucks a month or something. I was yeah. like, well, obviously that's not going to do anything for me, but I was still doing it because I was like, it's still fun. I still love doing it. And now I make a little extra money on the side. Like that's not so bad. So I was just kind of using it for, I don't know, gear money or something. Like I would just yeah. save it up to buy a new guitar. And then, you know, gradually it just kept increasing a little bit by little bit. And then it got to the point where I was working full time at my job. And then I was also doing YouTube this whole time. And basically like I was working eight hours a day and then I would get home and then work like five hours almost every day on YouTube. And I had like no free time and it was actually going really well, but basically it got to the point where I kind of hit like a ceiling, if you will, with YouTube, where I physically could not put any more time into it because I was working full time. And I kind of thought to myself like, well, in theory, if I had, you know, these 40 hours a week that I'm spending at work to spend on YouTube instead, would that be worth it? Would it, you know, provide me with enough money, all those things? Um, and the answer was probably, but I don't know. <laughs> but I was like, well, you know what, like, I can always find a new job if this doesn't work out. I'm still relatively young. So I said, fuck it and decided to go for it. Uh, so I quit my job. And obviously, thank you to my friends and family for being <laughs> supportive in this decision, because it was not easy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it is I basically got to the point where I was like, well, if I want to make enough money to live off of with YouTube, then I have to try living off of it. Um, and that's pretty much the moment when I had decided <laughs> to take YouTube super seriously which was like a year and a half ago now. Um, and yeah, it's going pretty well so far, for sure. Uh, better than I thought it was going to go, which is <laughs> great. Um, but obviously, it was a pretty scary decision at the time. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. It's just really, I liked making videos and I liked recording music. And I met, I'm lucky enough to have found a way to have that also make me money. So <laughs> that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Um, and like, kind of something that I've thought about a lot with um, YouTubers, especially in the music genre. Um, how do you decide on content? Like when you, when I see those, um, you know, drop A to double drop A or um, the Bring Me the Horizon riff evolution, how do you think about like, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to film today? Like, how does that come? Does that just pop into your head or? Uh, it depends. Uh, some of it is completely random like there are definitely some days where I wake up and I'm just like oh shit I need a video today what am I gonna do <laughs> and I just think of something um so some of it's not it, it's probably not as planned as people think it is at least in my case <laughs> um I know there are tons of other YouTubers who plan like weeks and months in advance I personally do not do that <laughs> any video you ever see on my channel has probably been filmed and recorded that same day or like at least a day before at most um, but yeah, I'm a pretty, like, I, I work better under pressure. So I like kind of always pushing the deadline, which is stressful, but I don't know. That's just the way I work. Um, but for some things it makes more sense. So like, let's use the bring me the horizon one, for example, like that one was entirely because they released a new album. So yeah. I was like, well, clearly they released a new album and tons of people are love bring me the horizon, including myself. So obviously there's going to be a ton of media attention on this band on this particular day. So obviously I should make a video about this band on this day to kind of like try and I don't want to say ride their coattails, but I mean, that's really technically what it is. Um, so yeah, it's, it, some of those decisions are just based off of that. Like what day will this video work best or, you know, or even if you look at a calendar and you're like, Oh, on, 
you know, November 30th, so-and-so is releasing a brand new album. So on that day, I should be ready to do a video on them. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes like last week, obviously I didn't know System of a Down released two new songs out of the blue. Yeah. <laughs> and I was surprised as hell. But, you know, uh, since I live, I think we live in the same time zone. I can't remember. Yeah. Since, okay, so 9 p.m. PST, which is where I live. So basically I get all the new music on Fridays on Thursday at 9 p.m. instead, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So sometimes on Thursday, I just stay up until like, four in the morning because <laughs> all the new music comes out at 9 p.m. and I just start at nine and do the whole thing so that way the next day when everyone wakes up the cover's already up um, nice yeah so there's some some strategy and then yeah. there's some that's not like yeah the double drop a or drop a to double drop a thing or like down tuned videos are not not quite as planned as that mm -hmm. those are more just like I know I can do those anytime so those are good to have for when there's not anything big happening in the metal world, then I still have other types of content that I know I can always yeah. make, if that makes sense. For sure. Um, and then double drop A, that's nine, <laughs> that's nine string, right? Or yeah, that, yeah. It, it's, it's okay. So a lot of people will debate about this. Uh, <laughs> apparently double drop tuning is not the way that I describe it. Um, apparently like double drop A would technically mean like your low three strings are drop A and then your high three strings are drop A as well or something like that. I don't really understand it, but the way that I've always thought of it is like, it's two times as low as drop A. So yeah. it's double drop A. Like double I just drop. thought that that yeah. made <laughs> sense. So that's the way I've always explained it. Um, but yeah, so that one is a nine string tuning, which is <laughs> stupidly low. Yeah. Uh, it's basically like it's the same as like tuning a five string bass to drop a that's that's Jeez, what it is that's yeah. <laughs> not that's nuts yeah. uh, what was the bass tuning for carcosa um a plague i just i that was kind of a question for me personally that i had uh yeah so the whole ep is in drop e um and the bass is an octave lower <laughs> so like drop e one or something oh like God. that um but we actually just use a bass guitar in drop a and then we pitch shift it negative five oh, so yeah. it's five steps lower meaning e because yeah. i don't have a bass with like a 180 gauge string on it right yeah, now so that, yeah <laughs> um yeah i mean so one uh, i kind of just have one final question before we wrap up um and that's you know i have a lot of um experience with international music i'm very passionate about music from um from you know um, other countries and i was just wondering if any kind of um inspiration uh came to you guys and carcosa or you specifically um from in you know, music from other countries um oh man i don't think from i mean there's lots of like amazing deathcore bands from all over the world but i don't know that it necessarily has anything to do with that particular country's um style you know yeah what i mean like um obviously like there's like tons of australian bands mm -hmm. that are crazy heavy but you know i don't know i'm trying to think here <laughs> i think that this would be something that our other guitarist cooper and uh, would probably have a better answer for because he does all of the like orchestral um like arrangements in our song oh uh, yeah for those he's very influenced by like uh by movie soundtracks and video game soundtracks so I think that that would be more, a little more international. Whereas for me, it's mostly just based off of other metalcore, deathcore bands, which, I mean, they could be from anywhere, but at the end of the day, like it still basically sounds like deathcore or metalcore. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily uh, culturally motivated, let's say. Yeah. Um, um, that's not to say I don't listen to music from other countries. Like mm -hmm. I, I know lots of people hate baby metal, but I love baby metal. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think they influence Carcosa at all. No, much, but you know, just saying, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I always like finding cool international bands, but I just am not entirely sure if they might've influenced Carcosa's music at yeah. least in terms of the riffs that I wrote. Yeah. Well, in terms of the stuff you listen to, you know, baby metal, um, maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm sure some, uh, Norwegian stuff in terms of that whole genre. I don't know if you're into that, but, um, yeah, I mean, some of it for sure. Like, well, I guess humanity's last breath is a, is a really good example. Yeah. Um, they are from Sweden, I believe. Um, and yeah, like we obviously take a huge amount of influence from them because they have like 
ridiculously low tunings they're deathcore and they have like huge creepy orchestral arrangements so they were a big one across the board for all four of us as an influence um and then i know that cooper again was very influenced by mick gordon i'm sure i was too subconsciously who is the uh the composer for the doom soundtracks and obviously i covered like every single song yeah. that's been on every doom or the last two doom games so i'm sure that must have crept in my wrist somewhere um i know i've seen people comment saying that it reminded them of doom and that wasn't necessarily my intention but i mean but, I'm, I'm you sure know subconsciously yeah i mean once you spend like a hundred hours learning yeah. all the music like it's bound to influence you somewhere right yep um well andrew thank you so much for taking the time um thanks so much for for coming on and uh it was a pleasure to be able to meet and talk to you um yeah, of course thanks for having me yeah and uh once again i'm max mariotti for ground zero radio um and we'll catch you guys next time